Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Following several attempts by American lawmakers that opposed a U.S.-led nuclear agreement with the Islamic Republic of Iran, the United States is ready to adhere to the unprecedented nuclear accord and grant sanctions relief as long as the Ayatollah regime adheres to the international community's demands and meets its obligations to curb its nuclear program. With us in the studio to discuss the meaning of this new reality are Mr. Owen Alterman, Research Fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome Dr. Eldad Pardo, a Middle East expert and a lecturer on Iran from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Welcome. I'd like also nice to welcome Mr. Owen uh, Meir Javed Anfar, uh, who is also a lecturer on Iran from the IDC in Herzliya. Welcome. Thank you. Owen Alterman, I would like to start with a question to you with regarding to the whole process in the United States. What actually went down there with the whole uh, U.S. Congress attempt to try and thwart this bid? They talked at the beginning about one law to try and pass it and thwart it. And later on, they came to a realization that uh, they'll try and have multiple laws, nothing <laughs> succeeded, everything failed. What happened there? Nothing succeeded, everything failed. Basically, as, as viewers might remember, the law, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, which is the relevant law here, was set up such that essentially uh, there needed to be a two-thirds majority in both the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, against the agreement for it to be able to be blocked. What happened, in fact, is we didn't even get that far. We got to the point where there were not even 60 votes in the Senate to kill it, uh, which meant that it didn't even go to a veto by the president, and it just died without even being voted on in the Senate. Uh, and now the agreement will be able to go forward. The mm -hmm. administration will be able to implement it. Dr. Paolo, how did the Iranians receive this? Uh, obviously, they've uh, talked a lot about the, the U.S. Uh, Republican side, where there is a strong opposition, but at the same time, there's also a strong opposition in Iran about this uh, matter uh, with future consequences. How is this reality playing out? Well, I think that uh, if you look at the people around the Supreme Leader Khamenei and the, the more, uh, let's say, uh, extremist or conser conservatives uh, in Iran, they try to to look uh, as extreme as they can. They, they are suspicious of everything the, the United States is doing. They are suspicious of uh, the IAEA. They, 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 they want to, to uh, check everything. Uh, and, and they are also, and this, this is something that goes on for two to three years, they are enhancing their uh, terrorist or uh, all, all kinds of activities across the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The thing is that Iran understands that uh, this is a good deal for, for Iran. And uh, I believe that the Supreme Leader would like to have this uh, deal as a, a method for the transformation of, uh, of the regime to, his, uh, to, to the person who will come after him. Mm -hmm. So he needs that. But the, the danger uh, of, of the deal for, for the current uh, regime, the, the way it, the makeup of Iran as it is today is, uh, is high, and uh, this is the dilemma mm -hmm. Iran faces. Mr. Javed the U.S. Republican or the U.S. opposition in the United States has really failed showing a certain support to the American uh, leadership when it comes to the agreement with the Iranians. How does it, uh, uh, this reality, how is it perceived amongst the Iranian people? Um, well, it's, it seems to me, based on, uh, you know, we don't speak to people from Iran, but uh, friends who travel to Iran and, and from the social media, it seems that, first of all, the people of Iran are impressed that in America there was a debate about it. There was a whole debate about this, that there was three hours. Uh, the, the Secretary of State, um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, John, Kerry. Mo, John Kerry, Moniz and, and Jack Lew sat there for three hours answering to their to the 
to the representatives of the American people. And this is why we have the same thing in Iran now. In Iran, the negotiation team is going in and answering to members of the parliament because the Iranian people was so, well, hang on, wow, in America, they're answerable to their own people. So on the one hand, it showed in America there's division, but on the other, it showed that the people of America, the, that the government representatives are answerable uh, to their people. In terms of whether it made lo America look weak or strong, um, I think actually in Iran today, Mr. Obama, between the Iranian people, is the most popular foreign head of state. Hmm. He's hmm. very, very popular with the people of Iran. Uh, and and this is there's a danger here. And, and I think this, uh, to, to continue with what Professor Pardo was saying, there's a very strong danger, and, and, and the Supreme Leader talked about it, in that people in Iran's decision-making circles might start becoming... Uh, infiltrated, their, the ideology might become infiltrated by West, might start having a more pro-Western and a more sympathetic view towards the West. I mean, let's face it, America has just given Iran, has reached an unprecedented deal with Iran. Of course, America is going to be very popular with the people of Iran, but this is a real danger for mm -hmm. the Iranian regime for the revolutionary trend in Iran, which is uh, in charge of the IRGC and the conservatives. And this is something that Ayatollah Khamenei wants to stop as soon as possible. We'll come back to this soon, uh, Mr. Alterman. How is this dynamic actually playing out in the United States? I mean, we're hearing here a certain uh, new reality in Iran in opposed to the the first or initial uh, uh, thought of the international community when it comes to this uh, reality. But at the same time, uh, it's a lot more complicated than this. How is this playing out? Well, sure. I mean, the United States is just as divided over this deal as it has been throughout the process. In fact, public opinion, there are different polls that come out with different numbers. It depends on how the questions are asked. But the trend line across all polls is of increasing uh, opposition to it in the pub in the, at least at the level of public opinion, especially among Republicans who are less and less supportive of the deal. Uh, in among the politicians in Congress, this has become a very partisan issue. There were only four senators who crossed party lines to vote against the deal, and that's going to continue. And now the presidential campaign in the United States will be continuing to kick into gear more and more, and the Republican candidates will continue to be talking about this issue, and this will be a big part of the 2016 race. It's not disappearing from American politics, mm -hmm. quite the contrary. Dr. Paldo, how does the Middle East respond to this new reality? I think uh, the chances of Iran uh, becoming, uh, you know, th th there is great fear in, in, in many, many people across the region, uh, here in Israel, in Arab countries and, uh, and elsewhere, that they believe that there is an, an Iranian-American policy of the United States switching side from the Sunni camp, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, uh, the Gulf state, Turkey, into the Shiite, the Shiite uh, axis. And uh, in the end of the day, of course, chances, that there, there are some chances that this, this deal will lead to regime change or regi regime moderation in Iran, but in all likelihood, uh, this is a very uh, well-organized regime, uh, Definitely, as long as Khamenei is alive, uh, and, 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 you, and you have a lot of inside dreams of building the Iranian empire, the, the, both in, in school textbooks and in the newspapers, they speak about the large, the large empire. There is a lot of hate to our, towards Arabs. So uh, it's, it's a major issue. Also, the, 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 main, the main question of ISIS, uh, you know, the American-Iranian collaboration for containing ISIS, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's an argument, but but one can can say, and many many other people believe that ISIS was a creation of of, of, of an American Iranian uh, collaboration and Turkish collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, this may sound a little bit uh, conspiratory, but 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 this is something that that people believe in, and 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 in a, in a way they are also right because they had had the policies of uh, this. Three countries uh, conducted uh, in a different manner. We would see a stable Iraq, uh, maybe democratic Syria today. There could could have been uh, a different scenarios. Mm. Uh, 
Mr. Javed Anfal, when uh, Dr. Pardo talked about a possible regime change, you shaked your head. Even uh, moderation. These are very dangerous words, but uh, Professor <laughs> Pardo is saying very dangerous. This is why, this is exactly what the regime is scared of. Look, compared to Ahmadinejad, Mr. Rouhani is trying to moderate. I know it's difficult to, to sit here when we hear all the time death to Israel from the Iranian regime. But if you try to look within the regime, comparatively within the framework of the regime, within its own ecosystem, Rouhani is trying very hard to bring some kind of moderation because he needs the economy back on its feet. And it's not just enough to have all the money released from the, from the sanctions relief, because Iran needs to have investment from abroad. The money that Iran is going to get is not enough. A lot of it is going to go to paying the debts that the government owes to the central bank, to the, to the ministry of the, you know, the, the, the power companies. It needs to pay its, a lot of the contractors. The government of Iran badly needs foreign investment. And Rouhani knows that as long as the RRGC is making mischief abroad, it makes it very difficult to make Iran look like a stable place where you can invest your money. So he is trying to moderate, to bring moderation. But Ayatollah Khamenei and, and the right wingers, they are very, very scared of this. They are worried that if you start shaking hands with America today, tomorrow they'll want to talk about human rights. They want to talk about democracy and the revolutionaries in Iran without hatred for America are left with very little. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you two examples of how much they despise the United States. There's a very famous professor, I can't remember his name, American, who loved Iran. His wish was to be buried in the city of Isfahan. He always said nice things about the Iran. Iran. The Iranian regime didn't allow it. They did not want an American who said nice things about Iran to be buried in Iran. Why? Because people of Iran might say, hey, America may not be the great, great Satan. And just one more example. You know, if, uh, Will Farrell had that song, Happy? Mm -hmm. There were some Iranian kids who made a parody to that. They were singing and dancing. They were put in jail because the Iranian regime is more scared of America's soft power in Iran than hard power, which yeah. is why the question of moderation that, that Mr. P uh, Professor Pardo talked about is something very dangerous and something that could, in fact, cost Mr. Rouhani's political future. Mm -hmm. He may be reelected again, but now because he's seen to be very conciliatory towards the United States, the regime may make him more toothless than before. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Altaman, we were talking also about the dire need of Iran for sanctions relief. Where does this stand? Well, where it stands is, uh, well, first of all, I actually want to go back to something that Mr. Javadarnfar said. What's very interesting is looking at the Iranian debate from the American perspective is that because the Iranian establishment and the regime is so divided, it gives fuel to both sides of the debate in the United States. Those who oppose the agreement will look at what the Supreme Leader is saying, what the, what the revolutionaries, as you put it, are saying. And those who support the agreement will look at what President Rouhani is saying, what he said on 60 Minutes uh, last night, and what, what has been said over the course of the past few weeks, if not months and years. So it is very interesting that this divide, the divided signals sent by Iran are transmitted to the United States and become part of the debate in the U.S. Mm -hmm. In terms of the sanctions relief, uh, given the attempt that the attempt in Congress failed to block the agreement, the administration has said that October 18th will, what will be deemed what the agreement calls Adoption Day, which is three months after the Security Council endorsed the agreement. And what ha will happen then is that the administration will issue the waivers of the nuclear-related sanctions that are required to be waived uh, under the agreement. And then the sanctions will actually be, not I shouldn't say waived, it should be very more, much more precise. It should be suspended. suspended. That's the correct word. They can't be waived by the administration, but will be suspended. And that those suspensions will go, be, go into effect on what is under the agreement called Implementation Day, which will, be, which will take place after Iran has taken the steps it needs to take under the agreement in terms of dismantling centrifuges, taking the actions at the heavy water reactors that it needs to take, and in terms of its dealings with the IAEA. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pelder? The, the problem is with this with this deal is that it keeps uh, Iran's nuclear power, nuclear industry, nuclear research in place, intact. And uh, after 10, 15 years, which is a very short time, we will we'll get out on the, on the other hand of on the other end of the, of the tunnel. Now, if optimists are right, 
we will see moderation in Iran, maybe a kind of uh, Islamic democracy, opening, uh, transparency and all that. But on the other hand, if we look at the past, you know, I remember myself and others uh, during the 90s saying, you know, Khatami, you know, in a few years, everything will be fine. And turns out that the regime in its structure is extremely sophisticated. Uh, so many election campaigns, a participation of uh, ethnic groups. It, it is much more stable than, than assumed. And uh, it's like, it's like as, as I, say, I said once, it's like a, a, a papacy grafted upon, upon a republic. And, and it works in a very wise, uh, wise manner. The, if the person after Khamenei is also an extremist, we will have a, 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 a nuclear Iran with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with imperial ambitions, threatening the United States, threatening Europe, and uh, and taking over the Middle East, this this is uh, this is something that that is uh, that is realistic. Also, in case of moderation, Iran may implode, and if they have the nuclear weapons, a small group of fanatics with apocalyptic ideas will also uh, be in possession of, uh, of of extremely dangerous. It would be like a, a terrorist organization with uh, missiles. So the challenge today is to double and redouble intelligence efforts in the, on the nuclear mm -hmm. issue, whatever other things happen on the mm -hmm. on, on politics. Mr. Javin Anfo, how does the European dynamic come into play? I mean, uh, uh, the Austrian prime minister uh, came to Iran, the first uh, Western head of state, to visit the Islamic Republic since uh, the, the, the past decade uh, or so. Uh, there's been different agreements made with different countries. Of course, the embassies in uh, London for Tehran and uh, on the, the other hand in Tehran for London have been opened. And there's been a lot of renewed cooperation on various topics, uh, various issues. How does this reality change the perception of the West when it comes to uh, this uh, nuclear agreement? Um, well, I think it really depends. I, I can't put all of Europe in one basket, but well, li look, the, the, the Austrians paid for the entire hotel stay and uh, how many days of negotiations, whether they hosted the negotiations. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, they did all, mm -hmm. they hosted the negotiations and everything. So I think this was their, they got this in return. I think that we, the European countries want to have more business relations with Iran. Everybody wants to have more, more business relations with Iran. If we could, we would also do business with Iran. We can't. This is, this is understandable. But the issue seems to be that the conservatives in Iran are worried about where this will go. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the Europeans are also going to have one, one uh, major concern. First of all, the conservatives in Iran are going, are going to think if the economy grows, people are going to associate Rouhani with this. And the economy is going to become stronger. They're going to say, look, Rouhani made our life better. And this will add to his popularity. And that could make the pro-moderation camp stronger. Mm -hmm. So that's the concern of the conservatives. The, the, the Europeans, I think their major concern is going to be, and this is related to Syria, is that they will not be able to do business with any Iranian company without somewhere along the line dealing with a company that's affiliated with the Revolutionary Guard. And if the situation in Syria continues, if, the situ if Iran continues to destabilize Israel's border, there is a strong possibility that the Revolutionary Guard, maybe not today or tomorrow, but in the future, will be sanctioned again. And this time, I think we're going to have a much more strong support from the United States. America is going, going to be much more united. And this is where the, the investment by some of these com com countries uh, in Iran could suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Alterman, we're talking about future sanctions. Of course, uh, there is a new law that uh, the U.S. Congress, the Republicans, will try to pass when it comes to sanctions under a clause of terror. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, the nuclear agreement forbids the United States from imposing on Iran new, quote, nuclear-related sanctions. Those are the sanctions that are being lifted. That will be, you know, the paperwork will be issued October 18th, and then they will eventually, shouldn't say lifted again, suspended. I should say suspended. It's, yeah. The differences are important. Well, the, the paperwork will be issued for the suspension on October 18th, and then they will be, would be suspended on implementation day. Uh, but the agreement permits the passing of sanctions not related to the nuclear program. 
And the reasons are obvious, exactly what Mr. Javadan Far said. What if Iran takes other destabilizing actions in the Middle East and the parties to the agreement want to impose sanctions targeted at those? There needs to be some kind of leverage uh, against that kind of bad actor. Uh, so what the Republicans are saying is, OK, well, we aren't allowed to pass more nuclear related sanctions, but Iran is about to get its assets unfrozen. Iran is continuing to destabilize Israel's borders, places like Syria, Iraq and other parts of the region. So we can pass these old sanctions or newly tailored sanctions under this new garb uh, of the terror uh, destabilization premise. Uh, and Bob Corker, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, is starting to work on this type of bill. He said it's going to take a long time to put it together and that it will be put together and potentially eventually come up for a vote. And it's a fine line. On the one hand, as Mr. Javadanfar correctly said, and as the logic would, would suppose, there needs to be some kind of leverage if Iran does things that are destabilizing in the Middle East. On the other hand, what Secretary Kerry has, has told Congress is, you obviously, it's not reasonable and it's not good faith to simply take the old nuclear age sanctions, dress them up as being used against terror or destabilizing the region, and pass those same sanctions within months of, of, the, of the agreement. So both sides, in some senses, are right. In practice, this, this type of legislation under the current political situation in Washington will get no further than the, than the legislation on the agreement will. It will still come up against a, a Democrat, a blocking minority of Democrats in the Senate, a presidential veto and so forth. What could change that? On the one hand, as Mr. Javadan first said, new Iranian actions in the Middle East that change the dynamic. And on the other hand, a new face in the White House in 2017 and new dynamics. I think, I think what's Please. very, sorry, if I, may, I think what's very important for the, for the, for the Iranian side to understand is this, look, they're in Syria, they're helping Assad do all those terrible things. It's not nice, but Israel could live with it. They're fighting ISIS. It's not nice, but Israel could live with it. But if they think they can open up a new front against us in Syria, this is a red line, not just for Likud, but for the opposition. And this is, I think, this is when there needs to be deterrence. No, I, I don't think, you know, what Mr. Altman said just now to go and uh, put, the, put the old sanctions in a new, you know, wrapping and say, you know, uh, the old atomic sanctions are now going to be in, in a different uh, paper, you know, and, 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 and with a new title. Yes, that's bad faith. But as soon as the Iranian regime, the IRGC, if they start threatening our border from Syria, I think that could be a strong deterrence to make sure that, look, mm -hmm. there will be a price to pay. And I think that will be a, that's a specific weapon. We're not, you know, we're not using weapons. The Ayatollah Khamenei said a couple of days ago, um, no, like two weeks ago, it says, in, hopefully in 25 years, Israel won't exist. And from now until then, we'll make sure that every, every day they don't see a day of peace. So if they decide to do that in Syria against us, I think the, the issue of you know, possible sanctions against the IRGC, I think that's something that Israel should seriously look at. Because if Iran wants to start a proxy war against us in Syria, we can start a proxy war against them in the Congress. Except this is one actually, thing oh, I'm sorry. Um, this brings me to another question to Dr. Paldo on the matter. Um, Dr. Paldo, uh, Netanyahu this week, uh, of course, uh, flew to uh, Russia, during which he held meetings with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Um, the Russian presence and growing presence, if you will, within Syria, where there are um, reportedly cooperating both with uh, President Bashar al-Assad's regime as well as with the Iranians, if the Iranian regime will indeed uh, take on itself, as uh, Javed Anfal put, building up a new front in front of the Jewish state uh, in the north, will Russia have a certain role to play in this new reality? Well, this is, uh, this is the question, actually. And uh, if, if you look at uh, the Israeli policies uh, towards uh, Russia in uh, last decade at least, Israel tried always to bring Russia and the United States together. To have the, we, we, Israel was extremely unhappy uh, with uh, you know, the conflict over Ukra the Ukraine and, and so on. Uh, the, the idea that there should be uh, some kind of international consensus regarding Iran was a major uh, goal for, for the, the Israeli policymakers. And, and, and paradoxically, even though Netanyahu seems to be extremely frustrated and angry about this deal, uh, to a great extent, this, this is really what, uh, this is the result of, 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 of this policy. 
Now, we have to remember that both Iran and uh, Russia have totally no trust with each other, and both have good reasons for that. And uh, I, I don't think uh, Russia would like to see nuclear Iran. They would not like to see a, an Iranian empire in this region. And uh, they, uh, they have some good interest also uh, in Israel, uh, cultural, strategic, uh, economic, not major, but uh, substantial. Uh, so th there is a lot of uh, room for uh, maneuvering. I, ju I just want to add so some Very point about, okay, about the sanctions. My feeling was that the, the current Iranian regime uh, actually would like to have some sanctions on Iran. They would like to keep the tension. Mm -hmm. The question is definitely to what, to what extent these sanctions mm -hmm. are really damaging. Okay. Uh, Mr. Altman, please. Oh, yeah, no, I was just going to add to something, uh, to something Mr. Javadanfar said. I think you're right, Mr. Javadanfar, that if there is some kind of dramatic change in the North that can't be denied, then yes, that could be a game changer in terms of the way the U.S. administration looks at this potential issue of reimposing or imposing new sanctions. But if it's any type of situation that's open to different interpretations of what Iran is doing, of how involved Iran is, of what exactly is happening, I think the administration will try to take the interpretation most favorable to Iran in order not to rock the boat and to be able to implement this deal. Mm. I, I think some actually, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Altman, but I think, you know, even American, uh, I think the CIA and other uh, uh, American organizations that deal with this, I think they are also uh, very much in tune with Israel's opinion that, you know, the Iranian regime has been working with Bashar al-Assad in terms of trying to build some some kind of a base on 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 the border with the Syrian Golan, but we have to wait and see uh, what happens if there we ever is. We don't have very much time. One uh, sentence from you, Doctor Paldo, on the matter. I I, I would say that, uh, that that Iran would be very careful not to open a new a new front uh, with Israel. Uh, so far, what Khamenei said is uh, maybe wishful th thinking. Strategically, in the long in the long run. Iran wants to take over the entire Middle East, including Israel. Not mm -hmm. specifically Israel, but including Israel. We'll That's have to stand in line. Mr. Javed Anfal? I think we are. I'm, I'm less optimistic regarding uh, Iran's actions in Syria. While Mr. Rouhani and the government want to reduce tensions with the West and with the Saudis and even with Israel, I think the IRGC are actually going to need a new project to, to increase the heat in order to strengthen their position, first and foremost, in domestic Iranian pol politics, because that's where it all starts mm. and that's where it all ends. Mr. Altman? The debate in Congress over this agreement, at least its first stage, is over and it will move towards implementation. But the debate is not over. Congress will continue to be involved and will continue to try to find ways to put spikes in the wheels of this deal. And it will continue to be an issue in the 2012 uh, presidential campaign and beyond. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Owen Alterman, Mr. Mayer uh, Javed Anfal. Thank you so yeah. very much, Dr. Eldad Pardo. It's been a pleasure. And I would like to thank our viewers, and we will see you next time. <laughs>